Hey guys, Chris from Adapt Tuition here. And in this video, I'm going to show you the solution for question four in the Jan 2008 PUA paper two. If you want to see the solutions to the other questions on this paper, I'm going to put a card up there and a link in the description below. So be sure to check those out as well. And with that said, let's get into the question. Okay, so question four has three parts, A, B, and C. The first part is a control account. The second part is a payroll part. And the third part is manufacturing. I know, all right? Let's, let's take a look at the control account part first. So it tells us that Frasier Group Holdings provides the following information about the debtors for the month of May 07. So we have balances at start. Actually, you know what? Let's pull up the control account and we're going to populate it as we go along and then just simply balance it off and find a closing balance. So sales that's a control account or debtors control account. So of course, this represents an asset of debtors. So it's going to follow the double entry rules for assets. Debit to increase, credit to decrease. Now, the balance at the start, it says 23, 4, 5, 10 on the debit side, and it says 6, 10 on the credit side. So assets usually have debit balances. Sometimes they can have credit balances, which implies that we owe our debtors some money. Maybe they overpaid, maybe there was um, something they paid for me, I think give them a refund, whatever the case is. That could happen. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility. If you want to see my control accounts video, I'm going to put a card up there and a link in the description below. Be sure to check it out. Okay, coming back here now. Transactions for the month, for, for the, sorry, transactions with debtors for the month. This on a check, right? That's going to go on the debit side. All right, let me explain why. Normally, when we receive a check from a debtor, it's going to go on the credit side because if a debtor pays us, the amount of money they owe us goes down. Hence, our asset is decreasing, which requires a credit to the asset account. Now, if the check is dishonored, it means we didn't actually get the money. Maybe they didn't sign the check. Maybe they put the wrong date. Maybe there was some mistake on the check. Or, most likely, they didn't have enough money in their account to honor the check. So, the check came back to us. So, we didn't actually get the money. So, we kind of have to undo the decrease. To undo a decrease, you have to kind of re-increase the account, right? Or to undo a credit, you have to re-debit, okay? So that's why this on a checks goes on that side. Next, we have bad debts 428. Now, bad debts is where we write off debts. We no longer can reasonably expect to collect the debt. Hence, we can't keep it on the books as an asset. So we have to remove it. To remove or decrease an asset, you have to credit the asset account. So you see another credit side here. Next, we have checks received, right? So when we receive checks, that means they're paying us off, which means our asset is going down, which requires a credit. Next, we have credit sales, 35790. This is the transaction that causes a debtor to exist in the first place. They end up owing us money. And when they owe us money, or more money because we made credit sales to them, the asset is increasing. And to increase an asset, you have to debit the asset account. Next, we have returns inwards, 244. So when they return goods to us that they previously bought on credit, they no longer have to pay for those goods. So if that's the case, it means the, the, the debt, the asset for us is going down, which of course is recorded via a credit to the asset account. Next, we have interest charged on late payments, right? So if the debtors don't pay on time, there could be a clause in the contract that says, hey, we're going to charge you interest for not paying us on time which means they're going to owe us more money, which means the asset is going up, which requires a debit to the asset account. And then when they pay us the interest, they are reducing the, the, the amount they owe us. So that's going to go on the credit side of the account, like this. Now, we weren't given any closing balances, so we could safely assume that there's only a debit balance. If there was a closing credit balance, they would have told us. So to find the closing debit balance, which will be brought down here, which means it's going to be carried down from this side. We're going to add up the debits, add up the credits, and subtract. Right? Again, like I said, that's, uh, the balance is going to be carried down from the credit side, and it's going to be brought down the debit side. Right? So, of course, now um, <clears throat> we're going to have the totals being the same on both sides of the account, and the 37,220 is going to be brought down on the debit side. Okay, so that's it for part A. Let's take a look at part B. Okay, so part B says Rishi Narine. Employee number 265 works for a company which pays a regular rate of $12 per hour, pays one and a half times the regular rate for all hours worked in excess of 40 hours per week. Next, it's, oops, sorry, it deducts national insurance of 2% of gross pay. 
makes, as he requested, a regular payment to his credit union of 10% of gross pay and deducts income tax at the rate of 20 cents on every dollar earned. And it says, sorry, it's not, right, there we go. During the week ending June 29, 2007, Rishi Narayan worked a total of 50 hours, 10 of which were counted as overtime. On the answer, she provided completely paste for Rishi Narayan for seven months. Okay, cool. So I'm going to pull up that page sheet below here. You're going to see some headings. Employee number, name, hourly rate. So they have a bunch of details here. So all we have to do is fill in the information. So for employee number, they told us that here. Employee 265. Okay, the name is Rishina Ryan. Now the hourly rate, they told us that the hourly rate was $12 per hour. So we're going to put that there as well. They then told us that Rishi worked a total of 50 hours, 10 of which were counted as overtime. So 50 hours, 10 of which were overtime. Now the regular pay, so this wages thing covers these three items here. So regular, so if you worked total 50 overtime is 10, it means 40 were regular hours. So the regular pay would be 40 by 12. We're going to put that there. The overtime wages would be 10 by what? Well, the note tells us that they pay one and a half times the regular rate for all hours worked in excess of 40. So one and a half times 12 is 18. Um, we're going to multiply 18 by 10 to get 180. So when you add those two regular and overtime, you're going to get the gross wages. Now, national insurance is 2% of gross pay. They transfer credit union fees of 10% and income tax is 20% on every dollar earned. Well, to find net pay, you're going to add these items here and subtract from your gross pay. And that's simply going to give us $448.80. Okay, let's take a look at part C. So part C tells us the following. Rogers and Sons presents the following information. So we have work in progress at start, raw materials at start, raw material purchases, direct wages, factory overheads, accrued factory overheads, work in progress at end, raw materials at end, and they want us to prepare a manufacturing account for six months ended, August 31st, 2007. Okay. So, of course, head up your statement. Rogers and Sons Limited, manufacturing account for the six months ended, 31st August 07. So, if you need to see how to do manufacturing accounts, check out my playlist above here or in the description below. But for now, let's go ahead. First item up is the cost of raw materials consumed. So, we are going to need the opening stock of raw materials of 69.20. Let's put that in first. Do we have any purchases? Yes, the next item says we purchased 45,890. We're going to add that. We have no carriage on raw materials, no down returns outwards. So that's by the so those things are going to add to give us cost of raw materials available for use, from which we will subtract the raw materials at end. That's going to give us the cost of materials consumed. Now we have direct wages 123.8. So of course we're going to add that here to get total prime costs of 179. Now we have to add factory overheads. We have two pieces, this one and the accruals. So it implies that we have to add those two figures together. Otherwise, well, how are we supposed to know not to add them? <clears throat> That's going to give us the total, well, the current period's production cost. And we have to add the opening work in progress of 2450 and subtract the closing work in progress of 3670. Let's put those items in. Net adjustment is 1220, which when subtract it is negative, by the way, because closing work in progress is bigger than opening. And we're going to get cost of goods produced or cost of goods manufactured, 230680 And that's the end of this question. All right, guys, so there you have it. That's the solution for question four from the Jan 2008 PUA paper two. If you have any questions about it, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below, and I'll get back to you when I have a chance. If you want to check out any more videos, I'm going to put some cards up here. Don't forget to subscribe and be sure to check out my website where you'll find some pretty useful PV handouts. Anyway, guys, as per usual, thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time. Bye.